this morning? Yuvia? So be praying for Yuvia and Jay. <laughs> no, awesome. If you will, go ahead and take this time to open your Bibles up. If you're not there already, uh, open up to Mark chapter 2. And I was uh, kidding in Sunday school about how your Bible should just open up to the book of Romans. And uh, hopefully that'll be true for the book of Mark here as we continue to go through it. And uh, we'll be in go verse by verse, line by line uh, through the Scriptures. So we are in Mark chapter 2, and we're going to be focusing on verse 18 to 22 this morning. But I've got a question that I want to present to you uh, as we open here and as you're turning. Have you ever met somebody who just seems to have a lot of Bible knowledge? Uh, They seem to know a lot about Scriptures. They may be a very good choice to choose if you're going to have a Bible trivia game at your home or something like that. And uh, they seem to have answers and they seem to know, you know, what the Word says on most things. Uh, But yet, there's still some kind of disconnect. Uh, There's still no joy in their life. There's no peace in their life. Uh, You don't see compassion. You don't see kindness. You know, you don't see those types of things that should be fruit and evidence of someone who's been changed by Christ. And uh, I'm sure as we're talking about it now, maybe you have people flooding into your mind, friends and family and relatives, uh, you know, some, something like that. And so the reason I bring this up is because today's text is going to be focusing on something exactly uh, to, to that point of what we're talking about, that there is this disconnect between kind of head knowledge and heart knowledge, if you will, um, of the knowledge of the head and, and translating how does it get to the heart. And we know that that's only by the working of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so a little bit of review to set the context for today. We have been coming into chapter 2. We've seen Jesus now doing a lot of miracles already. We've seen a lot of healings and, and great works that he's done and the, in fact, in the beginning of chapter 2, we've seen other miracles. Uh, in the first one was the account of the healing of the paralytic man. If, if you guys remember two weeks ago, I preached on how the, the, the friends ripped the roof off as Jesus is preaching, and they just dropped their friend right in the middle of his sermon, right, for, for healing, to get him close to Jesus. And so that, the, the odd thing about that, the different thing I should say about that from the other healings was, if you remember... He said to the paralytic man, he said, your sins are forgiven. And the reason I bring this up is because that time uh, I said two weeks ago that we are going to see five consecutive confrontations, if you will, questions of the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of Israel in that day at that time. Uh, In chapter 2 and chapter 3, we're going to see five consecutive confrontations that they have with Jesus, and that marked the first one. If you remember when the the paralytic man was in there, the scribes were questioning in their hearts, how does this man say you can forgive sins? Because only God can do that. And Jesus called them out knowing their thoughts, okay? And so then he says, this is just as easy for me to say, your sins are forgiven, and also rise and walk and be healed, okay? And that was the first of the five. And last week, Pastor Jonathan came through um, the calling of Matthew or the calling of Levi, which was, he was a tax collector, and he became one of the 12 disciples to follow Jesus. And that was the second one that we saw, because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, remember, Matthew did an awesome thing. Uh, I'm sure Pastor Jonathan, I I know, because I listen, I know he did a great job laying that out, and don't miss the fact that when Matthew followed Jesus, first thing he did was invite all his friends and sinners and everyone he knew to come to his house to meet Jesus as well. Okay, so that was just an awesome picture for us to see. Now, that was the second one, because if you recall, when that happened, there were Pharisees there in that instance as well, questioning him and wanting to know, hey, and they didn't even question him. They, in fact, didn't even go to him to question him. They went to his disciples and said, hey, why does your master, why does Jesus go and sit in there and eat and and have relations with tax collectors and sinners, right? They were looking down on him for what he was doing and questioning why he was doing them. So that was the second. And now today, we're going to see in our text the third of these confrontations uh, to put us in exactly where our context is for the verse. I want to set up chapter 2, verse 18. Follow along with me if you would, please. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. 
the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, so are the skins. But the new wine is for fresh wineskins. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we just thank you for the precious gift of your word. We thank you that we are in a place where we can openly uh, read and discuss and preach and teach your Bible, which is the infallible word of God, and we believe that, and we ask today that you, through your spirit, would enlighten us, you would give us the knowledge of the things you want us to understand, Lord, and how to apply that in our lives, and we ask all things in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the first thing I want us to see here today kind of goes with that question that I asked from the top, and it's religion versus relationship. And now, if you are not new to the church or not a new believer and you've been around for some time, you've probably heard this, this phrase said, relationship versus religion. It's not about religion, it's about a relationship. Anybody heard that, right, several times, okay? So, um, it's kind of Christianese is what I call it. It's kind of our Christian, you know, lingo for, for things um, that we tend to use too much. Uh, but there is something to that because when we speak of religion uh, in a world sense, we tend to think of things that you must do, right? Religion is all about things that you must do to gain God's good grace, to earn His, his favor, uh, to possibly earn your way into heaven. Uh, you know, most religions kind of think if uh, my good outweighs my bad, you know, then maybe I'll just make it. Uh, you know, that's kind of the view of, of most religions. Uh, now, a relationship and what we're talking about, now look, Christianity is a religion. Yes, it is. But what's different about it than all the other religions is it's not about what we do. It's about what's already been done. It's about what Jesus Christ has already done. It's the completed work that he did on the cross in his earthly life. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again three days later, and he has defeated sin. He has defeated Satan uh, so that all who believe in him will be with him in paradise and heaven forever, for all of eternity. So that's what we're talking about, that it's already been done. Okay, so right off the top today, I want to put the emphasis on this. This is what this passage, uh, the main point of this passage is what we're talking about in this text today, because the Pharisees are caught up in religious traditions, okay? And they're coming at Jesus, in fact, at, in the direction of, hey, why don't you look more like us? Why aren't you doing the things that we're doing? Because we're the religious ones. We're the ones that speak and preach and teach everyone about how you should be conducting your life. And Jesus looks starkly different from them. And they know that. And they see that. And guess what? All the people see that too. Remember those times uh, in the Gospels where we see that Jesus preached and they said he preached as one who had authority not as one like the scribes or the Pharisees that, that preached, that he was different. There was something different about him. And so even the Pharisees noticed that and recognized that, okay? And in fact, really it's the jealousy and the things that, that drove them into hating him and which eventually drove them to, to killing him and to fulfilling the Father's will by putting him to death on the cross, okay? So that's the problem is that they were all about the outward appearance. They were all about the show, and in Matthew's gospel, it talks about how the Pharisees loved to sit up in, in, the, in the best seats, in the grand seats of, of the temple, right? They loved the appearances. They would put extra long tassels on their garments and do all these things for what? For a show, to show them. They would go out. Remember, we hear about how they would go out and pray boastfully and, and loud in, in, the, in the streets and things so that people could hear them praying and hear how godly their prayers were. Um, so we see so many examples of that, and yet we don't see that in Jesus. And, and that reminded me, as I was studying here, if you would go ahead and put 1 Samuel 6 up on the, on the screen there, it reminded me of the story of, of David. And when Samuel was called to anoint a new king because Saul, the king of Israel, had been rejected, God told Samuel, the prophet, to go to the house of Jesse, and I will show you there who is the next king. And as Jesse brought his sons out. Seven boys were brought before Samuel, and God just kept telling him, nope, it's not that one. Nope, it's not that one. I know you think it was the oldest one. I know you think it was the big, strong one. I know you think it was the good-looking one. And here's the, the, the key 
uh, that, that relates to our text today. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And that's what we're talking about here. Okay, it's the heart of what we do. It's the heart of why we do it. And the Pharisees did not have that heart, okay? They weren't converted. And in fact, let's look at some of these others. Let's now talk a little bit about the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees. You see that that's who they're comparing and talking about. It says right there in verse 18, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but Jesus, your disciples, do not fast? Now remember, don't get caught up uh, too much in this. Disciple means what? It means a student. It's like a teacher-student relationship, a master and the, and the servant, okay? The master and the student, the master and the disciple. So John that we're talking about here is obviously John the Baptist, right, from the context of Mark chapter 1 and earlier. Remember, we recall that John has been put into prison, okay, which is where he has, is at that point in Jesus' ministry. Now, they're asking, why are John the Baptist's disciples? And then also you see the Pharisees have disciples as well. So all the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers, the leaders at, at that time would have disciples. They'd have students under them, okay? And that's what Jesus, in fact, was doing. When he went and called uh, Andrew and Peter and, and, and James and John from the boats on the docks, uh, their, their fathers let them go, and they knew what they were doing. They were given their life to go follow what? A rabbi, follow a teacher. This is what they would want to be doing. Okay, so there's something a little different here, though, that I don't want us to miss, because it's saying here that John the Baptist still has disciples. And so that's a little problematic because Jesus is now on the scene. You recall from when we preached through the baptism of Jesus, remember Jesus got baptized when he was about 30 years old, that was the start of his public ministry. And when John baptized him, he said, remember when he walked up, he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here is the one that I've been speaking about. I've told you it's not me. It's about someone else, someone whose sandals I am not even, un I'm even unworthy to unloose. And this is the one. And so John is deflecting from himself. He says, what does he say? He says, it must be less me and more him. And so it's all about Jesus, and he's the one I'm pointing you to. And at that time, his disciples would have left him to go and follow Jesus. In fact, Andrew is one of those. We find out that Andrew was one of John's disciples, Andrew being the brother of Simon Peter, okay? Simon Peter and his brother, two disciples. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist, who when John pointed to Jesus, he left, as did others, and went and they followed and they became Jesus' disciples, Okay, so this kind of points out something about these disciples, that they weren't doing that, right? They weren't listening to John. They weren't going to follow the one that they really needed to be following, okay? But yet, instead, they remained unconverted. They remained full of the religious ceremonial traditions that they had heard and seen in the Pharisees and Sadducees, and they continue to stay under that instead of following Jesus. And now those are the disciples that we're talking about. So that's the context of, of what we're talking about here. Okay, and remember that Matthew has just been called by Jesus and a few verses prior, that's why we went over that a little bit, and he invited his friends to come over. So we see these disciples of John and of the Pharisees. And picture this scene. You're in Matthew's house. Jesus, I should say, is in Matthew's house with all his friends at dinner. The Pharisees disciples and John's disciples are not in the house, but they're outside the house. They're like outside peeking in the windows, listening through the walls, looking through the doors, a little bit like the guys on the roof dropping their friend in, right? They're outside. And remember, I told you this a few weeks ago, how we will see the Pharisees and the scribes and the haters are following Jesus everywhere, everywhere. They're constantly trying to attack him and come at him and, and discredit him in some regard, and that's going to be to their own fault later, okay? But they're around all the time. They've seen all the miracles. They hear all the preaching of the gospel. Their hearts are not changed. They're unconverted, okay? And they continue to do these things. So as they're looking and they're hearing, they're listening and seeing what Jesus is doing, that's the context of what's happening. They're inside, and Jesus is having 
a, you know, almost it's like a party scene. They're rejoicing. Matthew's being called, hey, come meet this Jesus that's told me these things, and I'm following him. And in all the excitement that's happening, that's the context of now these Pharisees saying to them, hey, why aren't you guys fasting? Because we're fasting. Does that make sense? Maybe I can explain a little bit better. That there is only in the law actually one instance, one day a year, that the, that the people of Israel were called to fast. It was a day of atonement. Okay, so only one time a year was there actually in the law that you were to fast on a day. But the Pharisees added more and more and more to the people and to themselves. And we'll see that through and through. And in the Gospels, you'll find that they had at least two days a week that they fasted. Okay, so the Pharisees said, we fast twice a week. They said, we tithe on our, all our mint and our cumin and all our spices. Okay, they took it to the 10th degree. They kept going on and on and on and putting what? More and more and more yoke on the people. More burden on the people. We see in Acts where uh, Peter and James and them, remember in the council in, in chapter 15, say, let's not put more burdens on the people. We couldn't bear the burdens. Our fathers couldn't bear the burdens. We couldn't do these things. Let's not put that on other people. But yet these Pharisees, these disciples are continuing to live in that unconverted religious um, fashion in that way. Okay, so that's the scene. So now when we look at the fasting and we see the question, why do your disciples not fast? Think of the context he's talking about when he gives this answer. And in fact, he answers their question with a question. And guys, we talk about that a lot, that he often does that. So look at, look at how he does that, because he usually confounds them with a comeback. They usually ask him a question, and he says, well, you answer my question first. And generally, they can't, right? So the, the point that he's making here is, it's not time to fast. That he says, can the guest of a wedding fast while the bridegroom is with them? And he gives the answer, of course not. As long as the bridegroom is with them, they cannot fast. So you see the example he's giving. It's of a wedding. Like I said, it's a party scene. It's a rejoicing scene. Look, there's smiling, there's laughing, there's dancing. Uh, there's just all kinds of joy and happiness going on, probably eating, right, and drinking, which we know it was from the prior verses that Matthew was having dinner. This is not the time for fasting. While they're with the bridegroom, they need to rejoice and they need to be happy and to soak up all the time that they can because why? He gives us the answer in the next couple of verses. He says, but or however, the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then in that day they will fast. What's he talking about? He's speaking about his upcoming death. He's speaking of the time when he would be taken and beaten and put on a cross for the death of those disciples that, that follow him and the death of all those. He died the death for all those that would believe in him. So picture it. He's giving the disciples, he's kind of starting that conversation with the disciples of things that they're not going to understand. And we're going to continue to unpack that more and see that, that really up until the very end, is where Jesus finally opens their minds and their hearts to the gospel and understanding. They didn't understand what Jesus was coming to do, okay? They, they thought something totally different in their mind. So they don't really understand at this point what he's saying, but we, of course, do, and we can see that in, in the Word and see that while he's here, they need to be rejoicing and we need to do the work that, that we're called to do, but one day they will fast because the bridegroom's going to be taken away from them, okay? And we always see in Scripture that picture given to us of the bridegroom, right, of the marriage, of a wedding. And so we know that the, the bride is who? The church, right? The church is the bride of Christ, okay? And that's the, the context here. So when, when they come at him and ask him about the fasting, they really don't even understand what they're talking about. Again, it's just for them to say, why don't all of your disciples and all you guys, you're all laughing and being happy and eating and drinking. We're out here, you know, fasting and doing these things. You should be more religious like us. That's the key. You should be more religious and, and be like us, and we don't understand why you're not doing that, okay? Now, that leads to the next little saying that he says here, which, again, he's speaking here. He's given a little imagery. He's speaking in these short parables. When we look at verse 21 and 22, he goes to the old and the new, and he gets two examples here. 
And it's kind of, again, like the bridegroom, like the picture, the imagery, the parable that he's giving for them to understand what it is he's trying to say. And he would speak to them in parables, and they'd be for certain reasons, and I don't want to overlook this. I want everyone to understand that eventually later in the gospel, we're going to find that he only will speak to them in parables at a certain point. And the disciples even ask him, why do you only speak to them in parables? Meaning they're not going to understand. And he, in fact, says, I speak to them only in parables so that they will not understand. So he speaks to them, and it's like giving a parable that he's going to talk right over the head of those who are not supposed to accept it, and he's going to speak right to the heart of those that he is supposed to, uh, that he has intended for them to receive it. Okay? That's what we're talking about. So these parables can be hard for them to understand, but also hard for the disciples to understand. Okay, I want you to understand that, that they have a hard time, and you'll see many instances where they're going to come and be like, what does that mean? Like, what are you talking about? And the difference is he takes his disciples, his followers, the believers, and he explains it to them and tells them what it means. Okay, so when he speaks of these old and new, he says, you do not sew an old unshrunk patch on a new garment. We're in verse 21 and 22. The patch tears away, and it makes a worse tear. So here's the picture. You have an old, beat-up, worn-out cloth, and uh, they have patches that they would take, and they would sew it into the garments. Well, the problem is if the patch isn't shrunk and beat up and worn out, uh, it's kind of like a cotton shirt or something that you throw in the, in the laundry, and it shrinks up a little bit. So you're going to have a tear, and you put the patches the same size. Now the, the, the cloth, the garment doesn't shrink, but the patch shrinks. And now it leaves this hole, and it starts to rip the stitching, and it's just going to tear the thing even worse. That's the picture. Then with the wine bottles, what does he say? He says, you do not put new wine into old skins. So they'd have these skins, uh, you know, kind of canteens, kind of things that would hold the wine in, and they would keep them for a while. But the problem is that the wine inside would cause, you know, they'd be made of cowhide and things like that. So it would cause these things in the sun to dry up. Eventually, they would start cracking and leaking, okay, to where they would be no good. So they would take new wine skins and make new skins for the new wine. And he's laying out this picture, again, of a parable that he wants some to understand and that some will not understand. But it's the old versus the new. He's saying, look, your old ways of doing things that you're not doing properly and doing correctly in the first place, your old ways of looking down your nose on people and judging people and holding to higher standards than even God's law does and holding on to your traditional religious ceremonial stuff, to your circumcision, to your baptism, to your church membership, to your on and on and on and on, that ain't going to work. That doesn't mix with the new thing. The new thing, which we know in Scripture isn't a new thing, right? Jesus Christ has been the plan from the beginning. But he says, the newness of the new relationship that you find in me, that you will only get through Christ, that new life that's found in Christ alone, these two don't jive. They don't mix. They're like the wineskins that's going to burst. It doesn't work. Okay? You can't mix your religious, tradition, ceremonial things with your, the truth of the gospel. Okay, now, does that mean, oh, we don't have any traditions? That's not what I mean by that, where we say traditionally take communion the first week of the month. There's traditions that we do, that kind of things that we follow, but you understand we're talking about higher than that. These people are believing that their traditions and the way they follow the law, the way that they're circumcised, the way uh, the works that they do, that's why they want everyone to see the works they do. That's why, look at me, look at what I do, look at how I pray, look at how godly I am. They think those things earn good favor with God. They think they can be a part of earning their salvation. And the Bible tells us that that is just not true, okay? That no man seeks God, that no one can be saved without God, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and there is no other way to heaven but by Jesus, right? John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me or except through me. There's only one way, and these things do not mix, And in fact, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's the the thread that's through all of Scripture. And that's the point that we see in our text today. And that's really the application that we have for today. 
do you recall and remember a time when you were the old, as they're speaking of, the old wineskin? You were the old you, right? The pre-Christ you, hopefully, okay? And then there was a time when you encountered Christ, and He changed your heart, and you believed the truth of the gospel. And it says, behold, all things are become new. You are a new creature and a new creation in Christ. Perhaps you're here today, and that hasn't happened, okay? We're, you're still living under the bondage of sin, and you still don't understand fully the gospel. My prayer right now in this moment is that the Holy Spirit will do something to open your heart and your mind to understand exactly what it is we're talking about when we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is the only means of salvation for eternal life with Jesus Christ, the one that came to die for your sins. That's what we're talking about. We have the same application a couple weeks ago that perhaps you are saved, perhaps you are a believer, bondage of sin. You're still holding on to the baggage of, I must do something. There must be something I can do. And isn't it just, it's just the human way. It's just our human nature to be like, man, it can't really be that simple. It can't just be that I believe and I'm saved. It says that Abraham believed God and righteousness was imputed to him or credited to him. By what? Because he believed. Believe God. Over and over you'll find, how must I be saved? Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the key. It's belief. So if we are holding on to things, if we are trying to do things to gain God's good favor in our life, we've got to understand and recognize it's not about anything that you do. There's nothing that you can bring to the table. In fact, you brought to the table all that you bring, and it's all evil wickedness. Everything I bring to the table is just an evil and wicked heart. Christ is the one that changes us. He changes our heart. His Spirit lives within us. And now we will start to grow and start to learn and be convicted of our sins. We should start to have these old ways fall off of us as we're being made into this new creation, into this new creature. All of a sudden, you know, maybe drinking falls off, maybe cussing falls off. All of a sudden, you're going through this process and you can look back if you've been saved for a long enough time, you can look back and just see the trail of just wreckage and carnage that's been left behind in your trail and praise God and give glory to God for changing your life and for changing my life. And it's an ongoing process, you guys. This is not a light switch, something you do once, something you click on and it's done. This is a process. We call it sanctification, right? It's just a big fancy church word that means to be more like Christ, to be more holy. Okay, the word says, be holy for I am holy. Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's a tall tale, right? That, that's a, that's a, a high one to reach there, which we know we won't attain in this life. But the point is not to cop out of that and to make excuses about the pet sin that we're holding on to or the traditions or the things that we just have to hold on to because that's always the way we've done it. And it's the way I was taught and it's always been that way. Let's be always about this way. How about that? and do the things that God wants us to do. So yes, there is a, a degree of, of things that you must do. After you're saved, it's not done. We don't get teleported and transported right to heaven when you're a believer, right? It doesn't work that way. We're called to be the disciples on this earth, to be His hands and feet and be the light in a dark, dark world, uh, which has anyone closed their eyes for like a couple decades and not realized what a dark world we live in? Okay, we need to be light in this fallen place, especially right here in Island Rock in the Florida Keys. That's where most of you here are called to do that, and that's what we want to be doing. We need to be obedient. We need to stick true to God's Word. We need to hold each other accountable to that and strive to push each other on and spur each other on to do the things that we're called to do. And that's what it's all about. So let's not get caught up in all the traditions, all the pharisaical things that we can get caught up in. and be obedient to the calling and live a life worthy of the calling by which we've been called. That's my challenge to you today.
And so I want to close us today with a word of prayer, and we will be dismissed. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> just thank you so much for this time that you've designated for us to, to meet here, to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, that your word has been spoken, and God, I know that your word says it will not return void. I know that what was just sent out had nothing to do with me, it has to do with the plan that you've orchestrated for this group in this moment for this time. And God, I pray that you would just do the perfect work that you will do, and I trust in, in the fact and knowing that you will do that. And Lord, if there is one or two or more that are here, I pray that you would open their hearts, that they would be receptive to the knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ died for their sins, and they can be found new and made new with a newness of life in Him. We love you, Lord. We just thank you so much for who you are and all that you do. I thank you for, in advance for what you're doing in my life and in this body, in this congregation, in this place. We love you, Lord. We pray all things in the most holy and awesome and magnificent name, the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be dismissed. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. I will be down here in the front if you would like to speak or you have any questions about anything today, especially salvation needs. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Good to see you, Errol.